in order to have a laser, it's really not enough just to have an LED. You know, just to have a junction that is able to convert electron hole pairs into photons. That's an LED, but that's not a laser. However, a diode laser is made from an LED. The job is done by the optics outside of the LED. So this particular lecture is not going to have any semiconductors in it. We're going to talk about optics in this lecture and how you use optics to control and feed back the light that comes out of an LED in order to turn it into a laser. There are three steps that need to be followed. The problem is that the spectra coming out of an LED is way too wide. We calculated that. You know, it's on the order of 10, 20 nanometers, and that's not acceptable for a laser. You want one wavelength. Of course, you can't have one wavelength since wavelength is a continuum, but we have techniques that I'm going to describe here that narrow the selection of wavelengths down so much that you can get a very bright beam of light out of an LED that can go a long distance without the light dephasing, in other words, becoming incoherent, and hence being laser light. So let's go through these three ways of narrowing up the line width so that your LED turns into a diode laser. First thing is, is you need internal cavity feedback. The internal cavity is the semiconductor die, the block, the PN junction. So there's the internal cavity. You have type P and type N. This might be a hetero junction. This might be a homo junction. The surfaces are polished and metallized so that light reflects off of them. So the backside uh, surface is prepared so that it has a very high reflection coefficient. So light does not go out the back surface. Any photons that are born go over here and reflect back. The surface on the right is also polished and prepared, possibly metallized, so that it has a reflection coefficient that's not exactly one like this back surface, but is high. Photons hit it, they have a good chance of reflecting back and bouncing back and forth and creating a, an avalanche for us. But photons can escape. So there's a careful compromise in preparing the front surface here. We'll call this the front surface. And out comes a photon. And you know, the photon comes out this way because photons like to be directed down the PN junction. Remember, because the dielectric constant of PN junction is slightly higher in the depletion region than it is throughout the bulk semiconductor, turning the junction area into a fiber optic that polarizes and directs the photons all in one direction. We talked about the spectral width of it, but now it's a resonant cavity. And so this is why in general physics, we spend time talking about the vibrating string because this is really the vibrating string problem just uh, in a different form. Now it's, we're talking about photons bouncing back and forth between these two boundaries instead of a string that is tied down at these two boundaries. Otherwise, the same thing happens. You have certain frequencies that you can vibrate the string at and get a, get a corresponding commensurate wavelength, add them up. You can have a wavelength that is twice the length of this cavity. The important thing is the boundaries. The boundary conditions say the amplitude of the vibration goes to zero at the boundaries. That's the longest wavelength resonance that you can have in this cavity. If I said, well, how long? is the cavity compared to a wavelength, I'd say that the wavelength is twice the length of the cavity. So I might say that the, the length of the cavity is the wavelength divided by two. And you always have to include refractive index in that. Whenever you talk about a wavelength inside of a dielectric, you really need to divide wavelength by the index of refraction in order to get the actual wavelength. And so that's why the n is there in the denominator. The next one is it going to be a full wavelength. So one, the cavity length is a wavelength. Then the next one, the wavelength is two thirds, the cavity length. About to having this N here, it would be reasonable to say, well, no, the length of the cavity and one wavelength of this green curve are the same. They're not different by a factor of the index of refraction, right? They're, they're actually the same. Yeah, so these lambdas that you see here are free space wavelengths. They're the wavelength that the photon will have after it emerges from the medium that has a dielectric constant into air. So once the photon gets into air, this is its wavelength. And that's why we go lambda over n, because we want to use not the wavelength inside the block, which doesn't mean anything to anybody, right? I have no use for that. I need, I need a wavelength in air. You see pattern here, a pattern in this expression. It looks like, like when m is 3, the length is m lambda over 2n. When m is 2, the length is m lambda over 2n. 
you see the pattern. So the length of the cavity is m over 2 wavelength over n. Again, that's the free space, the vacuum wavelength. And m is an integer, right? Just m, 1, 2, 3, it's actually going to be quite large. Uh, it's not going to be a little number like 1, 2, or 3. And the index of refraction, we'll talk about gallium arsenide today. So n is 3.6 for gallium arsenide. If you take the derivative, pause the video for a minute, and do it yourself. You know, rewrite this as a function of m with m on the left and everything else on the right and take the derivative. You get that. Confirm. Good. I would make an argument here. Each one of these modes, they're modes, right? This, that's what you call them. The case where your lambda is twice the length, where it's equal to the length, where it's two-thirds the length, those are modes. Each one of these modes has a different value of the index m, different by one. So m equals one, m equals two, m equals three. DM is no smaller than 1, and, and for neighboring modes, it equals 1. So let's ask this question. How far apart in wavelength are neighboring modes? So you have the first mode, the second mode, the third mode, the thousandth mode, the thousandth and oneth mode. How far apart in wavelength are they? Well, let DM equal 1 and solve. So let, let that equal 1. So I'll call it delta M, I just M. And we'll have this delta lambda, which is what's left. Lambda squared over 2ln. Forget about the m. The dm was set equal to 1. So that's how far apart two neighboring modes are. The sub i n t does not describe the lambda. I mean, wavelength is wavelength. It describes the delta. This lowercase delta uh, lambda means a resonance due to the internal cavity. That is the semiconductor block. We're going to later have an external resonance due to everything outside. So that's what the INT means. It doesn't describe the lambda. It describes the delta. The separation of wavelengths due to internal cavity resonances is called the free spectral range, how far apart the resonances are. More frequently, people talk about the free spectral range in terms of frequency instead of wavelength. But uh, here you go. There it is in terms of wavelength. We talked about the semiconductor diode, the LED and the spectral width of it. We had a whole lecture on the spectral width of an LED. We came up with an expression as well for the width. I call it 2 delta lambda, so delta lambda is half width. It's quite large, way too large for use as a laser, but we can superpose those Fabry-Perot resonances on top. A Fabry-Perot resonance is the electromagnetic version of a vibrating string. If you have electric fields that bounce back and forth between two walls and resonate with a frequency that's commensurate with the separation of those walls, you call it a Fabry-Perot resonance. This is the delta lambda internal, uh, the, the separation between them. When we covered the spectral width of an LED, we calculated it, you know, and we found that it's on the order of you know, several nanometers. You know, for a laser, you want it to be you know, sub-angstrom, preferably under 100 picometers, but sub-angstrom, not 10 nanometers. But let's do a quick look back at the envelope calculation for a typical gallium arsenide dye, a length of 300 microns, a wavelength of 700 nanometers we'll work at, and uh, we'll uh, say N is 3.6. Okay, let's find out the value of this width. We came up with an expression in the previous lecture that that width is 64 nanometer electron volt squared divided by the band gap squared. Band gap for gallium arsenide is 1.8. So put that in there and you calculate 20 nanometers. So this spectral width from the LED is about 20 nanometers wide. Not sure why I said 10 up there, but it's about 20 nanometers wide. That's too wide. We need to have something a lot narrower than that. So now we need to do some optics in order to make that happen. And then the first thing is to say, if by chance we could just get one of these Fabry-Perot resonances to, to be excited, and we're going to have to control that, we're going to have to make that happen, then we would have delta lambda down to this. So you say just plug numbers into this expression that we came up with previous slide. Those internal cavity resonances are separated by this much. So there are this many nanometers apart from each other. Plug in the 700 nanometers for the wavelength and uh, 3.6 for N and L is 300 microns, you get 2.3 angstroms. So you're getting there. We're, we're definitely getting there. So I deliberately drew this as like just ripples on top of what is otherwise LED background. 
it's kind of like that. Uh, you get emission, you know, and even in these little in-between areas, just because of the fact that the LED itself has a, a lot of spectral broadening to it. So we need to get some control over that and choose one of these, and then we'll have something that's that wide, which is still not enough, but at least it's an improvement. But the neat thing is now, I only do this with, I don't know, 18 or 19 um, modes in there. But actually, if you, if you take this 2.3 angstrom separation between these guys, and this guy's 20 nanometers wide, you do have 87 Fabry Pro modes in this full width and half max of, of 20 nanometers. There are 87 Fabry Pro modes. Even more if you consider the, you know, the tails here. Uh, you, you'll probably be able to see those too. North of 100 Fabry Pro modes could be visible if you were able to step through these wavelengths. We have a technique for doing that. We have to select one of these guys. So we need a second method, and that's feedback. So the LED is putting out this broad spectrum of lights, but it does have those resonances, meaning that on certain wavelengths, those resonant wavelengths, the light that comes out of the LED is brighter. So just go back and look. So if I'm at this wavelength right here, the light coming out of the LED is, is brighter than if I'm at this wavelength. So that's that's going to get taken advantage of here. We're going to set up a feedback mechanism. So you have your diode, and the light comes out. It needs to be collimated because it does come shooting out uh, with quite a broad angle. So you collimate it and reflect it back. So we get something to reflect it back here with. Just think, imagine a mirror. You know, it hits a mirror and it reflects back. Well, it does and it doesn't because angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So actually, this light hits the mirror. And it wants to go that way. A lot of it will. You know, you will get this happening parallel output light at the wavelength of interest yeah but this isn't any old mirror right here this is a diffraction grating we're not going to dive into the optics of diffraction gratings here i'm just going to tell you an important property of diffraction gratings is that if you look at the grating say from the diode's perspective if you rotate that grating so it's at an angle right now right if we just keep changing that angle there will be certain angles where the light also reflects back at you so you know some of it goes out some but some of it reflects back at you just certain angles those angles it will get fed back in and only light at a certain wavelength so whatever angle i choose to hold this diffraction grating at only certain wavelengths will reflect back and they're very far apart wavelengths so basically as far as we're concerned only one wavelength will come straight back at us won't be a good reflector, but it'll be a reflector. And only one wavelength will come back at us, and it'll go back into the diode. The angle, though, is, it has to be just right. So if I wanted uh, a very specific wavelength, you know, 876.245 nanometers, I choose this angle to capture that wavelength. And it comes back into the diode, and now with light at that specific wavelength coming back into the diode, that's the wavelength that's dominating the stimulated emission. So now whenever stimulated emission happens, it's being being done by that wavelength. You, you end up getting an accumulation of photons at that wavelength. That's useful feedback, light feedback, not light feedback. So yeah, we're returning the wavelength that we actually want to get out of this, this thing. We'll do this in the experiment. You'll step through the wavelengths. We'll, actually, what we'll do is we'll rotate the diffraction grating so that we step through which wavelength is being reflected back, and you'll see the light coming out of the, the LED going dark, then bright, then dark, then bright, then dark, then bright. And we just select one. Like, you might select this one. I'm just randomly saying, oh, for example, let's select this one. Okay. Uh, but it's still too wide. It's, well, they're, they're separated by 2.3 angstroms. And just considering it to be a wavy thing, and then the width of this, this wave is about 2 angstroms. And that's still too wide. Okay, so we need a third thing. And the third trick up our sleeve is to set up an external resonator and use its Fabry Pro resonances. You notice that L in the, the denominator. If you have a very long cavity length, you get very narrow line widths. Set up uh, external cavity by, not, we don't have to add anything, we're going to use the diffraction grating. And this back surface of the die, which is highly reflecting, remember the front surface is only partially reflecting. So from the back surface of the die to the diffraction grating, we get Fabry-Pro resonators. The, 
diffraction grating might be one or two centimeters away from the die. So it's a long ways, and we'll call it the external cavity. If you calculate the line width due to the external resonator, same expression, lambda squared over 2nl, now n is the air, so it's just 1, because you're mostly in air here. We won't worry about the little bit of material that's involved for 300 microns. Plug in some numbers. You know, we're, again, we're just using 700 nanometers as a round number for the wavelength. Two centimeters, I think I did that right, is two times 10 to the seventh nanometers. Yeah. And plug that in, you get 0.123 angstroms. If we use this external cavity, now we have a very narrow line width. Let's do a blow up of a picture. So this is the LED's broad background, is this solid, smooth curve here. Then on top of that is the internal Fabry Pro resonances, which we have selected. Now we've selected this one. And then within it are the external Fabry Pro resonators that are 0.123 angstroms apart. So whereas this one we calculated is about 2.3 angstroms wide at full width and a half max, these guys will be 0.123 angstroms wide at full width and a half max. That's a significant effect, so we'll take advantage of that. Inside of each one of these internal cavity modes, there are 19 external cavity modes. Just go 2.3 divided by 0.123. And we adjust the diffraction grading until we are just sitting on the one that, that we want. So we'll choose this one. And that is the basic idea behind getting the narrow wavelength that you want you're out of a diode laser. I'll show you a video later of this done as an experiment so that you can process the results that we get in that little video. Okay. Hi, so here I am in the advanced lab at Hope College and we're going to tune a diode laser today. It's a semiconductor PN heterojunction with an external resonant cavity formed from a diffraction grating that we're going to be able to rotate in order to take us through Fabry-Pro resonances. And from that, we're going to be able to estimate the length of the semiconducting die, as we're going to be able to see all of these internal cavity modes as we rotate the diffraction grating. I don't think we can resolve the external cavity modes, but you're going to count through all of the internal modes. And from that, yes, we'll get the length of the die. So let's go over to the diode laser on the optics bench. So that's the diode laser, and there, the laser itself is inside this tube here. And this is the diffraction grating at an angle. And these two micrometers control the tilt of the diffraction grating, the top one in the vertical, the bottom one in the horizontal. And so all I have to do is turn this Allen screw that I have in here, and I can rotate the diffraction grating through several angles. And then there's a little CCD camera here, which picks up on, it, on the diode laser hitting this little screen. The diode laser is not visible because it's infrared, but the CCD camera can see infrared, and so we look at the output of the CCD camera on a TV screen. So that's the diode laser being captured by the CCD camera. So now I'm going to sit over here at the diode laser and I am going to adjust that screw. Your goal is to count how many Fabry-Pro modes we step through. So I do believe you're going to see, no, oh, I don't know, it could be about 200 of them. Just to warn you, it's a lot. And I'll warn you a few other things. There's some kickback from the micrometer, and occasionally I'll have to tell you, whoops, those two were the same one. So you just simply have to count, probably to about 200 or so. So here we go. Right now, the diode laser is just a diode, just an LED. And I don't have any feedback going into it. So let's get to the first Fabry Pro mode, have it go by. There we go. There was a blip. Did you see that? That was number one. Number two, and we're going to do this about 200 times. And trust me, it's far more tedious for me than it is for you. It will be over in 10 minutes for you. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. I'm at 12. 
short blip, long blip is one. We don't see any more. That's all of them. So we will stop at that. You stop counting. I'm going to put the micrometer back in somewhere in the middle here. You see what happens as we turn it. So somewhere in the bright area, I know I'm in the middle of the spectral peak of the diode. Let me uh, move, transport myself over to a table so I can talk to you a little bit about what I think we just saw. So you, remember, you have the LED with its spectral width which has a full width at half max of 2 capital delta lambda, which we went over how to calculate before. Let's make that appear. So 2 delta lambda is just 64 divided by the gap squared. And so for this gallium arsenide based diode, we're going to use a gap of 1.8 EV, which may be roughly accurate. So put a plus or minus 0.1 on that. And that gives us a 2 delta lambda of 20 nanometers. Probably we're able to step through twice that, at least this is a Gaussian, so here's a big estimate. Estimate that we're able to see lasing coming out over twice that width, so 40 nanometers of spectrum, maybe we can get lasing to happen. That's an estimate, so you probably need to put a plus or minus 5 on that. 40 plus or minus 5 nanometers of total width. I think that's what dominates our uncertainty here more than the number of counts you just got. So this is the, the free spectral range for the internal cavity, that is for the laser diode. You have this lambda squared over 2 ln, where L is the length of the diode laser block. And our goal in this experiment is to get an estimate for L. How many hundreds of microns is it? Th this number is wrong, it's 2.3? Nope, it's different for us. So you have the, the wavelength, let's go ahead and use 700 nanometers, because we are somewhere around it. Uh, it's 700 plus or minus 20 nanometers is the wavelength we're working with. And you have free spectral range of something that put in your 700. We just don't know what L is. What you can do, though, is you've estimated this to be 40, and you counted the number of Fabry pro resonances. So that's a measurement of little delta lambda, lambda internal, the internal free spectral range. So you have an estimate of this delta lambda internal from your measurement. So you can put a number in there and estimate L with error analysis, and you'll find something different than, you know, don't go numbers that you see here. That's your goal for this experiment, and I will turn it over to you at this point to do that. Oh, I might mention that I don't think we're resolving the uh, external cavity modes. I, I don't think those are at all detectable by us. We're just counting through these internal cavity resonances, of which there should be around, I think, about 200 of them. That's within our 40 nanometer range. I'll stop with that.